a great answer. Hello, it's Monday, July 3rd, 2017. You are listening to Inception Radio Network, voice of the fringe majority. This is Carol Carl with UFO Headline News. Here's what's making headlines at earthsky.org today. The Earth is farthest from the Sun on July 3rd. That's tonight. Good old planet Earth reaches a milestone today. It's aphelion. Let's spell that. A-P-H-E-L-I-O-N. Or its most distant point from the Sun. We reach that point today at 2011 UTC. Well, that's 1511 Central Daylight Time, for instance, in the United States. Is it hot outside for you on your part of Earth right now, or is it cold out? Earth's aphelion comes in the midst of northern hemisphere summer and southern hemisphere winter. That should tell you that our distance from the sun doesn't cause the seasons. If one considers an illustration, for instance, that shows the eccentricity, the oblongness of Earth's orbit, you can get the idea. And you can find that idea in actual form later at ufoheadlinenews.com. There are charts and graphs, etc. The fact is the Earth's orbit is almost but not quite circular. It's that oblong thing. So our distance from the sun doesn't change much. Today, we're about 3 million miles, 5 million kilometers farther from the sun than we will be six months from now. That's in contrast to our average distance from the sun, 93 million miles, 150 million kilometers. The word aphelion, by the way, comes from the Greek word apo, meaning away, off, apart, and helios for the Greek god of the sun. Apart from the sun. And that's us today. If you're curious about Earth's exact distance from the sun at aphelion, well, here we go. It's staggering. 94,505,901 miles, or 152 million kilometers. Last year, on July 4th, 2016, the Earth at aphelion was just a little bit farther than that. It was calculated to be 94,512,904 miles, or 152,103,775 or 175 kilometers. So, we've got it that the sun doesn't cause the seasons. Well, what does? According to Bruce McClure, who writes this for EarthSky.org, it's not a distance thing. We're always farther from the sun in early July, during northern summer, and closest in January, during northern winter. It's a tilt thing. Right now, it's summer in the northern hemisphere because the northern part of Earth is tilted the most toward the sun. And meanwhile, it's winter down in the southern hemisphere because the southern part of Earth is tilted most away from the sun. Earth's varying distance from the sun does affect the length of the seasons, though, and that's because at our farthest from the sun, like now, for instance, Earth is traveling most slowly in its orbit. That makes summer the longest season in the northern hemisphere and winter the longest season on the southern half of the globe. Conversely, winter, then, is the shortest season in the northern hemisphere. Summer is the shortest in the southern hemisphere, in each instance, by nearly five days. The bottom line, planet Earth reaches its most distant point from the sun for 2017, today, July 3rd. Astronomers call this yearly point in Earth's orbit our aphelion. And wherever you dwell on planet Earth, we hope you have a sunny day. Things seemed pretty sunny over at Space Tech today. Here's the headline. SpaceX's first reflown Dragon capsule successfully returns to Earth. Daryl Etherington writes this for TechCrunch. SpaceX has another historic achievement under its belt, being first to refly a commercial spacecraft to the International Space Station and back. The Dragon capsule that it used on its most recent ISS resupply mission was used during a previous trip to ferry supplies and materials for scientific experiments to that orbital facility. This Dragon capsule originally launched in September of 2014 before being refurbished and used again on June 3rd. After docking with the International Space Station around 36 hours after launch, the spacecraft spent about a month at the station, where astronauts unloaded its payload gradually. 
Early Monday, the Dragon capsule decoupled from the ISS and made three departure burns to begin its deorbit. Then, a few hours later, it completed its deorbit burn, re-entered Earth's atmosphere, and deployed its chutes, splashing down as planned in the Pacific Ocean around 8.14 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The good splashdown is another big win for SpaceX's vision of reusable spacecraft, which will help decrease the costs of commercial space operations dramatically. SpaceX had to cancel a launch attempt on Sunday for its Intel 35E mission, but it says they're going to have another launch window today that will open at 7.37 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We'll be watching this story for updates here at Inception Radio Network on UFO Headline News. We'll keep you in the loop. Speaking of loops, we're pretty sure you're all holding your breaths for an update on that chicken sandwich in the stratosphere. Yep, we covered it for Off the Beaten Path, our weekend feature here at UFO Headline News on Inception Radio Network. And so here goes the update. This is written by Mike Wall. He's the senior editor at Space.com. The chicken has landed a little earlier than planned. There's a company called Worldview Enterprises. They use their stratospheric balloon. It's cargo, a Kentucky Fried Chicken chicken sandwich called the Zinger. It touched down yesterday, June 30th, about 17 hours after taking off, according to Worldview representatives. The flight, the first planned long-duration mission of Worldview's uncrewed stratolite vehicle, was scheduled to last four days, but controllers ended it early, quote, due to a small leak in one of the company's innovative new altitude control balloon systems, end quote. That's from Jane Pointer. She's the CEO for Worldview. She said, quote, That said, we are extremely pleased with the results of the mission. Many of these systems were flown for the very first time and tested together simultaneously. Pending an analysis of large amounts of flight data and key learnings from this mission, Worldview plans to launch additional stratolite test missions with increasing flight duration in the near future. End quotes. The stratolite is designed to operate at altitudes up to 28.5 miles, or 45.8 kilometers, for weeks or months at a time. The vehicle allows researchers access to a hard-to-study region that's higher than most airplanes can reach, but too low for satellites. The balloon, whose name is a portmanteau of stratosphere and satellite, can travel long distances through the atmosphere or hover over the same spot on Earth for extended periods. Customers will be able to use stratolites for a variety of purposes, everything from Earth imaging to providing Wi-Fi service. Kentucky Fried Chicken signed on to this stratolite test mission as a way to market the company's Zinger Chicken Sandwich. KFC representatives have billed this mission as a trip to space, but stratolites don't get that high. The boundary line for space is generally regarded to lie 62 miles, 100 kilometers, above Earth's surface. Arizona-based Worldview is also developing something. It's a balloon with a crew, a system called Voyager. It's designed to take paying customers to an altitude of about 20 miles, 32 kilometers. Seats aboard a Voyager mission, which will give passengers a view of Earth's curvature against the blackness of space without the rigors of a rocket launch. Well, those tickets are currently selling for $75,000 apiece. We have a guess about what they'll be serving for lunch. It's not lunch, but it's very tasty. It's an article. It's part one, a series of three, and you can bet you'll hear them all right here at UFO Headline News. They're written by Cheryl Costa, she of Syracuse New Times and the desktop UFO reference book written with her spouse. Here's this article, the first part of three. The title, Project Blue Book Origins. Back on May 25th of this year, a news item in Variety magazine announced that famed director Robert Zemeckis had teamed up with A&E. They're going to produce a 10-episode drama series about Project Blue Book for the History Channel. For those unfamiliar with Blue Book, it was an Air Force's effort from 1952 to 1969 
charged with the responsibility to investigate reports of unidentified flying objects. Let's take a brief look at the convoluted origins of Project Blue Book. It began with Project Sign. During World War II, numerous bomber crews reported seeing luminous balls and disks in the air in their airspace while flying missions. These unknown high-performance flying objects became known as Foo Fighters. The Army Air Force's investigative effort into Foo Fighters was the very first by intelligence officers into the mysterious topic of UFOs. In 1947, the Air Force separated from the Army and became a branch unto itself. That same year, Air Materiel Command at Wright-Patterson Airfield received orders to direct the Technical Intelligence Division to conduct a classified inquiry into UFOs. The principal reason was the Air Force had taken a keen interest in UFOs because they'd been frequently observed near various sensitive military facilities in the Southwest. In addition, during June and July of that year, UFO reports came in from over 38 states and were widely reported in the press. Under pressure to come up with answers, Major General L.C. Craigie, that's spelled C-R-A-I-G-I-E, Director of Research and Development for the Air Force, directed the establishment of a research group codenamed Project SIGN. After eight months of interviewing highly credible witnesses, conducting investigations, and analyzing the data, it was time to report some findings. The Technical Intelligence Division at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, in concert with personnel from Project SIGN, decided to author the Estimate of the Situation document. That's estimate with an uppercase E and situation with an uppercase S. By all accounts, the top-secret document allegedly concluded that some of the UFOs were of extraterrestrial origin. These conclusions did not sit well with Air Force Chief of Staff General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, who was reported to have rejected the estimate of the situation findings. It is alleged that all copies of this report were subsequently destroyed. And then along comes Project Grudge, it's been Cheryl Costa's observation that military generals who aren't happy about the performance of a unit, or perhaps the results of a project, frequently clean house of at least key command personnel, and sometimes there's a clean sweep within the ranks. General Vandenberg, being less than happy or confident with the results of Project Sign, ordered a massive change in personnel. The replacement staff had a new set of operating principles— simply that all these UFO reports could be explained in realistic and conventional terms. The new unit was renamed in February 1949, that new code name Project Grudge. The Project Grudge team also put forth the concern that an enemy could release strange aerial objects, augmented with psychological propaganda. The effect of an enemy action like this, they proposed, could be used to generate mass hysteria. The Pentagon's Office of Psychological Warfare confirmed this notion of psychological warfare to induce war nerves and mass fear among the civilian population. As a secret UFO investigation military entity, Project Grudge didn't do much better than Project Sign in getting to the bottom of the UFO phenomena. The unit only lasted about eight months. In the final report of their UFO investigations, it listed UFO sighting reports totaling 273. Despite Project Grudge's policy that UFOs are just misidentified conventional objects, hysteria, war nerves, hoaxes, and deranged persons, their final report listed 23%, or 63 cases, as, quote, unidentified. Stay tuned. This was part one of three parts written by Cheryl Costa regarding Project Blue Book. We will read them all for you. Here's an article from OpenMinds.tv. It's a sighting in Idaho. Headline, Idaho Witness says Orb UFOs joined, then disappeared. This is posted by Roger Marsh. An Idaho witness at Bowie, that's spelled B-U-H-I, reported watching three orange-red, rectangle-shaped objects 
they joined together and then disappeared in place. This is according to testimony in case 83942. That's the MUFON number. The event occurred at 10.15 p.m. May 23, 2017. The witness stated, quote, Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um, I know this, I know this, I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, switching to GEICO could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. They'll allow it. Congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico. Because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Observed three rectangular bars of light. These rectangular bars of light seem to be composed of orbs. Orange-red in color. End quotes. The witness observed the three rectangles moving... Quote, the three bars of light moved smoothly in a horizontal fashion, end quotes. Eventually, all three lights formed a single light. Quote, the lights on the left and right joined or moved and joined the center light, and then they blinked out. There was nothing there after the sky being brightly lit by big orange-red forms, end quotes. Idaho MUFON Assistant State Director James Millard investigated this case. He closed it as an unknown. The witness did include an illustration with that report. You can check that out for yourselves later at ufoheadlinenews.com. Here's a snippet of a story from the Yorkshire Post out of the United Kingdom. It seems a UFO investigator has captured footage of mysterious dancing lights in the night sky over Yorkshire. Headline, Is This a UFO Over Yorkshire? Footage shows unexplained crazy dancing lights. The strange phenomenon appears to show a light moving in circular motions in the sky over Bolton Abbey, North Yorkshire. But the lights are apparently visible across a larger section of the country as well. The man who captured the footage is remaining anonymous, and here's what he said, quote, They are very visible. They're literally everywhere. I'm going out again tonight to Bolton Abbey. I'm only using my phone. If you have a decent enough camera, you'll pick up a lot more. It's been three days in a row that I've seen these things. It doesn't look like they're going away. I understand how crazy this sounds, but honestly, check it out. The story ends by asking, so what exactly are these crazy dancing lights? And have you seen them? And there will be links later at ufoheadlinenews.com, gentle listeners, if you've seen them and you want to comment about them. Crazy. Hang on now, our trajectory will shift dramatically. We're heading down to Panama City, Panama for this sighting. We picked it up from New Fork, the National UFO Reporting Center. This occurred on the 18th of June, 2017. It got a same-day report. The shape of this object was oval, and it was watched by the reporting witness for one hour. Here is the account. Brightly lit, almond-shaped craft, static in the sky in Panama City. An almond or oval-shaped craft was observed in a direction where no such object has been observed for a whole two years before June 18th, 2017. Its proximity to buildings provided reference points that the craft was static. The object generated its own energy source as it was brightly lit. Its appearance recalled to me a previous sighting in early childhood in South America. This was observed by the entire neighborhood, and it also featured an object being similarly lit. In that South America sighting, the object sat up high in the sky, slightly higher than the horizon. This craft was located much higher up, possibly in the Earth's upper atmosphere. But it was far closer than a satellite would have been, and again, it did not move. Stars that evening were also seen clearly. They looked like distant dots. This object also appeared to have a rod-like shaft of light sticking downward out of its belly. It's not possible to tell whether this was a light beam or a solid part of this craft. The general impression was similar to the flight of a wasp, except this object didn't move. 
because the craft's shape was elongated, it was wasp-like, and it could well have been a transport vehicle. It was too far up in the sky to make out any occupants. It looked rather large. The observer does not know how long the object remained in place, as it was only seen for an hour, after which the observing person went to bed. The observer has seen craft with the naked eye twice before, but never in this area of the country. This object could certainly be described as having the broad characteristics of similar UFOs. The reporting observer went out the next evening and ascertained that no such object could be seen that night in the clear night sky. The object had vanished. That's always wise. Check the next night. The planets, the stars ought to be in pretty much the same location. So that thing, if it's gone, well, it wasn't a planet or a star. We're seeing a bright light in the distance. Oh, that's our time signal signaling us we're out of time. We've got to fly because that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Inception Radio Network. Follow today's broadcast at ufoheadlinenews.com. Take care of each other. We're all in this together. This is Carol Carl. See you tomorrow.